Well, first of all, you have to understand how it happened. I went to see Burning Bright on Broadway uh, with an actor who I will leave nameless, who was obviously very drunk on stage. And it was annoying because if you know Burning Bright, Burning Bright is an everyman theme. Do you know what I mean by an everyman theme? And it's a beautiful, beautiful play, a beautiful piece of work. And I felt that this actor was destroying the play. The play fell apart. It folded after two weeks and the, and the actor was a big star. And for, for a long time, I kept walking the streets and thinking at night, I kept thinking about this play. I want, I want that play. And by this time, I had done a couple of plays that had received good critical notice. I was only 23, 24 years old. So I went to the agents for Steinbeck, and I said, listen, you give me this play to do off-Broadway, and I will do a wonderful job for you. I know I can make this play work. So I got the rights. It was incredible. And in the play, I took all the people from the actor's studio because I was in the director's seminar on the Kazan in, in the studio, and we had good access to all the actors. And I took four, it's, it's a cast of four, I took four actors from the studio and started rehearsing, working on it as a project. Now when we put it in the theater, we had a theater that was 125 seats and was what they call a Tudor stage, three-sided. And the little girl who was playing the lead, single, the only girl in the cast, was wonderful. She had a wonderful quality that made her uh, very vulnerable, very, and yet strong. So I just, I don't know, you know, the, the, when you're young, you do silly things. As we were going through the play, I started rewriting. And I said, you know, I think this will work better here, better there, and I started writing here, writing there. And one day, I'm giving them some rewrites and I noticed the actors are looking over my shoulder in the theater, the dark theater. We got work lights on the stage. And they're not listening to me, they're looking in the theater. And I turn around and there's John Steinbeck. <laughs> now, in America, John Steinbeck was God. And of course, I didn't realize, here I am rewriting his play, he's sitting there listening not saying a word. So I gave the actors a break and I went back, introduced myself. I had never met him. And I said, I hope Mr. Steinbeck, now you know, he sees me, I'm a kid, okay? I said, I hope it's okay if, you know, once in a while I see things. He said, you know, I watched all the stuff. He says, I love it. He said, go on, keep doing it. He said, because you're bringing something fresh to the play. I was. You know, it was a great honor. So he stayed for two more days until I had uh, literally staged the first blocking of what they call the blocking of the, of the play and had done whatever rewrites and notes. He never said no to anything. He said, no, he said, that works, that works, it works good. He said, good luck, he said, I'm going to California. And he left and uh, and that's how that came about. I don't think people think about that. Um, and, the, and the other thing is that the only time you really, you really have to dig with an actor is when you're not getting what you want. But if you communicate with the actor and tell him what the needs are, and you let him know before you ever start, you know, then he has to bring it. And if he has trouble bringing it, then you, you'll find things for him to work with, you know? Um, just sometimes a prop or sometimes the other actor. There's the famous note 
that Kazan wrote to uh, Marlon Brando on Streetcar Named Desire, 1947, uh, where he said that uh, Kowalski, the character in The Streetcar, he said when he sits down at the table and there's a beer, he pets the beer because he loves it. That's his life, okay? All right. <laughs> That's the method, you know, whatever, you know, and I'm sure all Brando wanted to do was drink the, the beer.